Uh, now I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna give you an idea for a show. How you feeling? Yeah, you want to hear a story? Because I am a keen student of human nature. Uh, I had not met this gentleman so three or four days ago. Uh, I'm talking to a group of quasi fucking bosses. And uh, I think you have gathered by now that I, I don't do well. You know, uh, uh, as long as I am active, I can accommodate my hatred. <laughs> but the minute I begin to be an observer, I posit the moat. So this gentleman was sitting off in the corner, and uh, he was like this while I was talking. And I'm thinking, sure, well, he's probably some fucking, you know, meet the press or law and order or one of these miserable bastards. And finally I say, he, he has to speak. I says, oh, go ahead and speak instead of sitting over there like the passive aggressive cocksucker you are making people think, oh, he's very boring. <laughs> he's reviewing my performance. That's my ambivalence to order when I am not in the spirit. And in fact, this gentleman then presented the crystallization and, 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 and made coherent everything I was trying to say. And he, was, he had been moved. And that was why he had his head down. And uh, that's why I have to keep working. Because when I'm not working, I am an unlovely creature. So I'm so glad that uh, you're here and that you've forgiven me. And then, in the, with characteristic authenticity, I tried to make my apologies by offering him money. <laughs> Isn't that right? Yeah. I kept trying to give him $5,000. <laughs> Feeling pretty good, huh? So here's, so here's the story, and then I'm going to take you back to how I got the idea for the series, and I'm going to try and trace for you all of the associations that we bring to the premise of the story that we conceive, and how as writers... Uh, the thought of structure can purify uh, some of the less than authentic connections of our personal association to the materials. You know, when you think about, well, the premise of a series, the premise of a series, and everybody is sitting there, uh, you know, if you're in with the bosses, say, oh, this is what they'll like trying to figure out what they want. What we as writers know is, the more fundamental question is, what can I do? And I, as a sociopath, in terms of just meeting deadlines and stuff, I'm very good in a room. Well, Dave, do you think you can have it in two months? I said, I think I can have it in six weeks. I don't hold me to it, but two months isn't going to be tough. Now, I have no intention of delivering in two months. <laughs> but I also understand that they don't give a fuck either. All they want to do is come out of the meeting saying he's going to do it, and if he doesn't, I'm going to have someone to blame, which is really all that fearful people want, is to know that they'll have... He said he could do it. This no good son... And, but he's got talent. So now what have they done? They got five months to do their project instead of two months, and the last three months they got from blaming me. I'm down for that if you pay me. <laughs> I'm not as stupid as I look. Wait, I'll tell you, what, I'll tell you one story about that. Uh, <laughs> this is horrible. Uh, you know who the Janists are? Who are the Janists? 
And what, what sort of idiosyncratic uh, habit do they have? And? They've been known to drink urine. It's just a, just a little stray piece of information. So, so uh, uh, I had, um, uh, let's see, I don't know, I'd left whatever, I guess I'd left MTM or something, and I'd been signed by Columbia. And, uh, and there was an interval in between, you know, when one contract kicked in, and when one contract ended and the other one kicked in, and I thought, you know, uh, let me try and kick dope. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm researching the various lockdowns and all this shit. And the only thing is I said, don't put me in with any of these fucking religious fanatics. You know, because that ain't going to work. Plenty of Advil, plenty of whatever the fuck it is. So I go, so, so I, I, I uh, uh, go through the withdrawal and stuff, which, you know how you're, oh, I'm afraid it's going to be terrible. It was, believe me, it was just as terrible as I was afraid it was. Um, but, uh, you know, I was, uh, as they would say, dry if not sober, and uh so now I got to go to work for these people. And uh, all of the, my act is intact, you know. And, there's, and it was just at the time when MTV and all that shit, when the wisdom was long-form television is dead. But if anyone can bring it back, it's this maniac. So, the, so they're, and all of these guys are the heads of long form, the heads of this. So they're looking at me. And I say, boys, you have not misplaced your trust. <laughs> when do you need it? They said, two months? I said, well, I think I can do it in six weeks. But two months <laughs> is going to be no, no fucking problem. Now, the only problem at this point is I'm not using. And uh, I'm kind of suicidally depressed. What's funny about that? <laughs> so uh, my wife is here, she'll remember. I, I, you know, I tended to lie in the darkness. That was about it. Daylight, nighttime, where's Dave? Oh, he's lying in the darkness. Uh, tick tock, you know, the time's going by, this and that. Uh, so whatever it is, the six weeks comes up. Uh, they call me up. How's it coming? I said, you didn't get it? <laughs> they said, no, we didn't get it. Did you send it? I said, oh, Jesus Christ almighty. I'll tell you what, I sent, I sent my only fucking copy. Are you kidding? You didn't get it? <laughs> now, this is the first creative work I've done <laughs> since I kicked dope, right? <laughs> well, let's check. Let's check. Well, I'll tell you what, I don't want to get in anyone, anyone in trouble. But after you check, if you don't find it, do you mind fucking firing whoever lost it? So they, they, they we, we fired the whole mail or whatever, whatever it is. Well, let me, let me go to work on it. Jesus Christ! So uh, now another six weeks go by, you know, and now I am actively contemplating, you know, uh, shuffling off the mortal coil. Uh, and they say, and now they say, uh, listen, we're here with our attorneys. They call me up. See, uh, you're not fucking with us. And all of a sudden, they aren't that intimidated anymore because now we're playing their game, which is doing nothing. Are you doing nothing? Because that's our job. I says, you know, uh, as it happens today, I'm not feeling well, but you are pissing me off. Uh, what ex why don't you come out and say what you're accusing me of? You're saying I, didn't, I haven't been working? Now they're back 
oh, he's crazy, so now they're more comfortable. No, 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 we're not saying that. We aren't saying that, but it's just, you know, it was lost. You didn't make a cop. It's just, uh, I, it so happens I don't know how to use any of those fucking machines. I'm not sure they're here to stay anyway. <laughs> bah, 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 bah. So uh, now I think, I, I, you know, I got to get going. I got to get going. I hear, well, but what's all this stuff about the noose and all of that stuff? How can I put that in the premise of the show? You know, because the premise of the show was supposed to be about a family some, so that was all uh, undercover. One of them was the actual criminal, and the other three were cops who were living with them, and they were just whatever. The, uh, it, it wasn't my idea. Um, and my whole thought process is, okay, so it's, it's the one guy who's a released convict, and he has this inexplicable desire to hang himself. And every time he keeps trying to hang himself, he goes into the room, and the cops are trying to hang themselves. I think that's not going to work. That's, how is that a show? Um, so... Anyways, I, I'm not, I'm not going to linger on this, but uh, so finally the day comes when they say, they say, are you coming in? And I've canceled four or five times. Just, now, this you're not going to believe. I'm, I'm, I'm in an auto accident. I got hit here. I can't get in. You know. So we've exhausted all of the logistical excuses and stuff. So I said, all right, listen, I'll pitch it to you on the phone. I'll pitch it to you on the phone because uh, at least I can stay in darkness. And uh, I'm not actually able to dress myself because I, I wasn't that far along in my recovery, you know. But I brought up, you know, uh, some apple juice and uh, I said, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. So I start yappy, 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 yappy. And uh, as Paul says, you know, it's, it, it's always out there for us. It's always waiting for us if we accept it. I start talking. It starts to make kind of good sense, you know. I engage with the premise, and it begins to humanize itself, and uh, I'm going along. I'm thinking, you know, and, uh, the only thing, my only problem is I've drunk the apple juice. I need to urinate. Well, no one's watching. So I urinate in the cup that I was drinking the apple juice from. I put it down. I keep going, you know. Uh, now, what's so tough about that? What's coming? A drain in the booth? Yeah, I drank the piss. <laughs> Middle of the pitch, I drank the piss. <laughs> I don't know. I don't see what's in it for the Janus, you know? <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> nice. What did it, who was it who said that? Chekhov or Ibsen, you know? Don't put the gun over the fireplace unless you're going to shoot it in the third act. So, uh, back to the, uh, the series idea and, and how one came to it. Uh, but just one more digression. Okay, what time is it? In what time zone? Uh, so we started an hour. We've been going for an hour. That's not too bad. Okay. What's the digression? You can't remind me because I haven't told you yet. Uh, oh, Coleridge. Anybody read? Uh, go ahead. Come on. Get up here. Yes, you are. Or I'm coming down there. Come on, tell me what you mean. If you say, oh, my fucking God, now you got to testify. Come on, we're going to hold hands. Okay. I'm going to say one thing. I'm going to sit down. You were talking, and as you were talking, it occurred to me that what I had to say to you was that Coleridge said, grant me a being having two natures, the one of which tends to expand infinitely while the other attempts to apprehend or find itself within that infinity, and I will make rise up before you all the human intelligences and all their manners of representation. And then you mentioned fucking Coleridge. My brother. That's weird. 
Oh, it's not weird. That's we know weird. what it is. We don't have to say it. It's not insane. So, another version of what this gentleman just quoted to you. Nice memory. I'm only that good with resentments and grievances. <laughs> um, in uh, the Biographia Literaria, which I commend to your attention, he was a junkie, of course. And that was before they had Metamucil. <laughs> he was afflicted with horrible constipation. And the measures that he had to take were not pretty. Um, uh, Coleridge made an effort to distinguish between fancy and imagination as a principle of association. Now, this is very, very important because if you give up the outline, which is logic, if, if, if you take a step back and think what we're doing here, you are watching me associate as a principle of organization in our communion with each other. I am associating one experience with another experience. I'm reacting to you. Um, an imaginative association, Coleridge would suggest, is what we are doing now, which is that available to us on the basis of this shared experience is an understanding of the substance of the experience. That is how the artist gain it, gains access to the imagination of his audience. Uh, through the provision of uh, and the vitalizing of, the bringing to life of experiences to which the viewer can relate on the basis of the, uh, of the operations of the imagination of the storyteller. Not because there's a prior expectation that, okay, at the end of the first act, Judge Steinberg, but as a vital exchange of energy. That's the way the universe works. Okay? A fanciful association, and this is the, the danger or the, the uh, burden of the inauthenticity that those of us who work without outlines must bear in the achievement of the act of imagination and that is fancy now I kind of tried to plant just the way I did with the, the urine uh, the when when we were talking about principles of association and this gentleman said oh I was thinking of Coleridge and you said Coleridge uh, and I suggest that that is not an accident, but that the substance of what I was suggesting was bringing to mind an imaginative association from this gentleman's past of where had he encountered those ideas before. So that's not an accident, nor is it a fanciful connection. It is an imaginative connection that's what art does. We are creating art together here. The audience is always a participant with the artist in the creation of the art by apprehending it in faith, uh, which is why I urge you, you know, not to watch Law and Order, which is an exercise in logic. Um, a fanciful association is a private association. Uh, uh, the example I often use is when I hear, uh, I'm old enough to remember this, but probably no one else here is. There was a song called Runaway by Del Shannon. Anybody? 
Well, that doesn't prove to me that you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, so I, whenever I hear runaway, I think of the first blowjob I got from a white girl. <laughs> now that's a fanciful association, by which I mean it just so happened that the first time I had successfully forced a girl's head down on my virile member, <laughs> Runaway was playing on the radio. There is nothing intrinsic in the music of Runaway that would make anyone else think of the first time he experienced oral sex with a member of any race. <laughs> a private association. Um, as we conceive of the premises of the art which we would share with others, we encounter this paradox that the things in our, in our experience which have disposed us perhaps to become artists, the sense of being outside looking in a little bit, invariably are fanciful associations. Uh, which is to say that the thing that sets us apart typically is atypical or wounded or hurtful. There is nothing inherent, for example, in the experience of being a son that uh, would generate the particular type of associations that I have with being a son. Um, yet the experiences that I had in being a son are what disposed me to that sense of doubleness which in certain environments could lead to the commission of a murder or by the grace of God could move me to want to share my faith as the only moment of behavior which liberates me from my fanciful associations. It's an interesting paradox, isn't it? Which most of us resolve by trying to go to work inside the temple, which is to say we look for surrogates for whatever experience we had which made us feel as if we were outside the temple to bring us back inside the temple. That's why so many writers pursue abusive relationships with their employers. Isn't that interesting? Um, don't be sorry. Don't be. Sh Come here. <laughs> Come here. Come here. What's your name? Eric. Hold my hand. Come on. You got no. Hold this hand. Now everyone says, Eric, we forgive you. Eric, Eric we forgive, forgive you. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Don't you feel better? <laughs> so, um, how to determine that uh, one's connection with the premise of a series is imaginative rather than fanciful? Uh, now, one way to turn away from the fanciful and possibly hurtful associations with our past, which after all is one way or another always going to be the substance of our storytelling, um, is to turn it over to somebody else. Go to the hurtful surrogate for whatever originally created our sense of doubleness and say, what do you want? I'll give it to you. I got the talent. Tell me what you want me to do. 
that's a way of avoiding the curative process of taking the fanciful association with, with the past and making it imaginatively available to the audience, which, if we're able to make the journey, will heal us. That's what Paul figured out. Um, so, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, here's, I'm going to give you one show to do. And this kid that I saw over at, uh, uh, that I used to see at the racetrack a lot. Um, this is going to be, this is a show that's set at the racetrack about the rivalry between two great racehorses, which lasted over several years. Now, uh, just to get to the end before we start at the beginning, and we won't go on too long. What time is it now? And when when did I stop being lost? About two twenty. So it's an hour and ten minutes. That's not too bad. You want to take a break or something? Anyone need to make a sissy? <laughs> you can. Of course, I always do it right where I'm sitting. So <laughs> the trick is, uh, there's no shame in doing it right where you're sitting. The shame is drinking it subsequently. <laughs> Unless you are a person of a particular religious conviction. Um, so isn't it fun when a seeming irrelevancy then by the accumulation of subsequent associations is made to make sense and seem like, oh, he's not crazy, he got out of it. That's storytelling, folks. Um, and I am trying to testify to the fact that every seeming digression, if you stand back far enough and if you have enough faith, is part of a single experience. That's that's why, you know, some people say that the artist is God's fool. Um, so the racetrack. So two, uh, two great racehorses. One comes from South America. One uh, is, uh, is bred here in America. And uh, one is very unfashionable, and the other is very fashionably bred. And uh, the, the thing that they have in common is that they're owned by different types of assholes. But the, uh, uh, you know, wait, I, I, I should have told you this, in making a distinction between fancy and uh, imagination as a principle of organization and connection. <laughs> it's a funny joke. These... Uh, I, I, well, some of you are probably alcoholics, probably are alcoholics. But anyways, it, there's a, you know, and if you go to a bar, there are certain bars open like at 6 in the morning. And you don't, you tend not to get a high-class clientele at that point, you know. And, and uh, so those of us who would frequent bars at whatever juncture in our experience at 6 in the morning, you know, you, uh, it, it, very few people who drink at 6 in the morning can get the glass to their lips unaided. And so... You know, you wrap something around your neck, and you get the the glass and this thing, and then you you you, you know like that, and uh, you hear uh, mostly what you hear is people trying to achieve the placement of mucus in their lungs at that time of day, <laughs> because they're also you know they smoke a lot. So anyway, these, uh, and people don't talk a lot in there. But anyway, so there's two guys in there, and they're sort of looking at each other. Uh, and they, they, they throw three or four down, whatever it takes to even out, you know, the shakes and get the mucus placement right. And now they're feeling good enough that they can exhibit a little hostility, you know, because they've been checking each other out. And when he says, what, 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 is there something in particular about me that interests you? And I says, I, I, you're familiar to me. Oh, really? 
Well, why don't you, uh, I assume you're keeping a journal, why don't you write it in a fucking journal and say that I saw a guy who was familiar to me and then go drink somewhere else because you're pissing me off. So the other guy says, uh, let me just ask you one question. Are you from Erie, Pennsylvania? And the other guy says, what is this, some kind of fucking joke? What, are you a process server or some fucking thing? I assume you know I'm from Erie, Pennsylvania. Well, see, this is the thing. I think I, 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 I'm not a process server. I think I recognize you. From where? It's, how the fuck do I know where you recognize me from? Did you go to Bishop Hill in high school? Oh, now we're getting into fucking X-Files territory. <laughs> I did go to Bishop Allen High School. What year? What year? Ace is 1967, I graduated. I graduated in 1967. So where did you live? Allen Road. I lived on Allen. So the bartenders, you know, watch this. Another guy comes in. And he sits down, the bartender looks up from his paper, the guy says, how you doing? He's pour, the bartender's pouring the third guy a drink. And the guy says, what's going on? He says, no, nothing, the Thompson twins are shit-faced again. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, a lot of times, that what would seem to be a fanciful association, in fact, conceals an imaginative connection, a genuinely shared experience, and we have to tell ourselves that it's fanciful. Because, for example, it's hard to deal with some of the complications of fraternity. So at one level, you know, it's, that's very funny, and, and yet at another level, the reason we laugh yeah, Freud said, you know, laughter is the release of fear at the things survived. That what would seem to be a devastating experience, two guys so far gone, and I take the trouble before getting to the punchline of trying to bring the atmosphere alive in the bar, what it's really like to drink in a bar at 6 o'clock to create an atmosphere of reality which makes the culmination of the story, which is a joke, somehow it has sunk its roots a little deeper than that. And just vaguely we have a sense that there's a tragedy which took place. And we don't even know that consciously. 